Hi everyone. I wonder how you're enjoying your staycation this summer. It's been a bit frustrating not to be able to travel where we would like, but I hope you've enjoyed the opportunity to explore some of the beauty a little closer to home. A bit like this spot not too far from my house in the Craigantlet Hills. Because one of the benefits of this forced staycation is that it's allowed us to actually open our eyes and look around us, to be a little bit more aware of our surroundings and appreciate some of the gifts of creation right on our doorstep. This idea of looking, if you'll remember, um, featured in our sermon on Psalm 122, I mentioned how looking about being aware of your surroundings is an important aspect of pilgrimage. Pilgrims are encouraged to open their eyes and look at the nature around them as a way to contemplate God. And we find ourselves back with this theme of looking in Psalm 125. The psalmist here looks to the hills around Jerusalem, to the mountains, as a way of contemplating and reflecting upon Israel's relationship with God. And we're gonna to get to what those hills represent in a moment. But I thought I might begin, begin just by exploring a little bit more this idea of looking, of attentiveness as a spiritual practice. Because maybe you're feeling a little bit confused by it, about how the idea of looking might help you in your spiritual formation. Maybe you're even a little bit suspicious. After all, it does sound a bit wishy-washy, doesn't it? it? Certainly doesn't sound very reformed. But of course, while our tradition places special emphasis on the centrality of scripture in our spiritual formation, this has never been to ignore the significance of the natural world. As the reform pastor in Marilyn Robinson's novel Gilead puts it, this is an interesting planet. It deserves all the attention we can give it. And you know, the Reverend Ames is thoroughly reformed in his thinking here. In fact, his words could be a paraphrase of John Calvin. If you've read any Calvin at all, you will no doubt have stumbled across the metaphor, a favorite metaphor of his, where he describes the world as the theater of God's glory. It's everywhere in his writing, from his commentaries and his sermons, and of course his famous institutes. You see, for Calvin, nature itself sings to us of the goodness and glory of God. And for that reason alone, it is our duty to be attentive to it. Of course, Calvin isn't saying anything new here. Like most things, he's taking his lead from scripture. Take the Psalms, for example, full of hymns, thinking about the beauty and the glory of God reflected in the natural world. I'm thinking maybe in particular of Psalm 19. Let me read it with you, just the opening. In this psalm, it's remarkable how creation is imagined as preaching to us. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out to all the earth their words to the ends of the world. The psalm always reminds me of the opening line of one of my favourite poems. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. Psalm 125, the psalm that we're looking at today, calls us to pay attention to our surroundings, to open our eyes and look to see what creation, what God um, presents to us in his creation. And in Psalm 125, this means bringing the mountains back into our view. Uh, and I say back because, as you're well aware, we've encountered the mountains already in this series of looking at the Songs of Ascent, haven't we? In particular, in that psalm that we seem to keep coming back to, Psalm 121. You'll know by now how it begins, I'm sure. I lift my eyes to the hills. And in that psalm, um, Christoph helped us um, understand and see that the hills represent the fallacy of pagan worship and the false hope that it offers. 
In opposition to this false hope, the psalmist asks himself a question, where does my help come from? And the answer, of course, is, well, my help doesn't come from the hills. My help comes from the Lord, the one who made the hills. And now if we think about Psalm 121 in the sequence, in the context of these 15 songs of ascent, we can maybe appreciate why the hills are um, presented to us in this way. In that early stage of pilgrimage, a little bit far from Jerusalem, the hills were a threatening place, a place where danger lurked, highland robbers, um, vicious animals. But as the pilgrim gets closer to Jerusalem, to that city on a hill, well, the hills take on a new significance. Suddenly, they represent safety and security. And this is what we have here in Psalm 125. Uh, we're just going to focus on these two verses today. Um, these two images that we get in verse 1 and 2. Two mountains that represent two different things for the psalmist. Let's have a look at the first one again. Well, this first verse concerns God's people, doesn't it? Those who put their trust in the Lord are like the hill upon which Jerusalem is built. They're like Mount Zion, we read, which cannot be shaken, but which endures forever. According to the psalmist, there's something solid about the life of faith. When we're in a relationship with God, we're on sure footing, he tells us. We cannot be knocked from our feet. This is a really encouraging image of the Christian life, isn't it? But I wonder, do we really believe it? In the last few years, in a very short period of time really, we've seen dramatic change in the spiritual landscape of Ireland, haven't we? Fewer and fewer people are going to church on a Sunday. I've noticed this myself firsthand, just going around different congregations um, as I've been in training for ministry in the last couple of years. We're seeing more and more empty pews. And this, I think, makes us feel sometimes that the ground is not solid, but it's shifting beneath our feet. And we all too easily buy into this narrative of decline. And with that comes a fear that Christians will backslide. A particular fear I think we have for some of our young people. How do we keep them in the faith? How do we keep them in the church? And whether we mean it to or not, we're subconsciously conveying to them this idea that the life of faith is a precarious thing. That it's something that is a little bit insecure and shaky. Psalm 125 would tell us that this is not so. We are on firm footing, the psalmist says. Yes, of course, we need to nurture our faith. That's what this whole series has been hammering home, hasn't it? We're on a walk. We're on a pilgrimage. We're active in following Christ. But at the same time, the security of the Christian life doesn't depend on our efforts. We know that we're secure in our faith, that we have a robust faith because of who it is our faith is in. We're following Jesus. And as the writer of the Hebrews tells us, Jesus is the one who both begins the race for us and who finishes it ahead of us. I like the way Eugene Peterson puts it in his book, Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Let, let me read to you what he says. Though I have to warn you here, he does mess up our beautifully consistent metaphor of walking a little bit, but we'll forgive him for that. The emphasis of Psalm 125, he writes, is not on the precariousness of the Christian life, but on its solidity. Living as a Christian is not walking a tightrope without a safety net, high above a breathless crowd, many of whom would like nothing better than the morbid thrill of seeing you fall. It's sitting secure in a fortress. Walking? Sitting? Which one is it, Paul? Well, it's both, isn't it? Because Jesus says to us, come, follow me. And he also says, abide in me. Find your rest in me. 
So don't buy into this narrative of decline. Ours is a faith that is solid, not shaky. Ours is a robust faith. Why? Because it's secure in God. And this is where the psalmist now takes us with this second mountainous metaphor. Here he looks again to the hills, but not the Mount Zion, not that hill upon which Jerusalem is built, but the hills surrounding Jerusalem. And he looks at these hills as a metaphor for God's protection over Israel. Well, the staycation weather has got the better of me here a little bit. I've had to stop and put my jumper on, but I'm going to keep going. Um, for your benefit, it might keep the sermon a little bit shorter. So we've got to this idea of God's protection over Israel. Let's have a look at the verse again. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. There's something very comforting about this image, isn't there? This picture of hills surrounding Jerusalem, it's almost as if God is wrapping his arms around his people. But of course, we have to remember, as we, we mentioned last week in our sermon, that these hills didn't always protect God's people from the enemy. But we shouldn't think for a minute that the psalmist isn't aware of that. Of course he is. He knows it much better than we do. In fact, many scholars think that this psalm was actually written at a time of foreign occupation. You get a hint of that, I think, in verse 3. But even in that case, the metaphor holds true, doesn't it? Because even at times of difficulty and trial, God's people can look out at those hills and have their present circumstances put into God's perspective. This is what Psalm 125 teaches us, I think. Having a relationship with the living God does not take our problems away, but it helps us to see them more clearly. I'm reminded here of an illustration, uh, a preacher that Emma and I um, used to listen to before he retired a couple of years ago in the States. His name's Jack Rhoda, and he was the minister of a church Emma and her family attended for a year when she was younger. In one of his sermons, he's trying to give an illustration of prayer, of what prayer is. And he paints this picture for his congregation of, um, of when we come to prayer, it's like we've got this large sack over our shoulder. And it's filled with all our, all our problems, all our concerns and our worries and our anxieties. And when we pray, it's like we, we open up this sack, we take out our, our problems and our concerns and we lay them at the feet of Christ. And Jack's point was that, of course, we're meant to leave them there. But what we so often do is we put them back in the sack again and carry them off with us. Now, Jack got an email um, that, that, that week after that sermon from a lady in the congregation who said she appreciated um, his efforts with the illustration, but she just didn't think it was true. Because she felt when she, when she prayed to God, well, God didn't take her problems away. She couldn't just leave them at Jesus' feet. But what prayer did do for her was, it helped her to see her problems from a new perspective. It gave her God's perspective. I think that's what these hills do here, isn't it? Eugene Peterson gives us another way to think about this in his, his book. He talks about Israel's history as a sawtoothed history. history. And what he means by that is he takes that image of a saw. You know the teeth on a saw? They go up and down, up and down. And while there are ups and downs, there's also a constant. And there's an intentionality to it. And what he's saying is that while Israel's history may have ups and downs, there's also a constant. And that constant is the presence of God. The assurance that God will continue to be with and for his people. This is how he puts it. God is steadfastly with them, in mercy and in judgment, insistently gracious. We get the feeling that everything is done in the sure, certain environment that God redeems his people. You know, it's the same for us. God continues to be present with us in mercy, at times in judgment, and he's insistently gracious to us. 
Some of you will know um, the minister of my home congregation, Steve Stockman. Last week, or a couple of weeks ago, I think, in his sermon, Steve uh, talked to us about a favourite place of his, probably his favourite place in the world, uh, the beach at Bally Castle. And he commented about how in the times that he's away there on his, on his holidays, he's more attentive to his surroundings, a bit like what we've been talking about. And he's noticing things on the beach. And one of the things he's noticed is how changeable the beach is. You can go at different times of the day or different seasons in the year, and you can find different configurations of the stones and the sand. The sand itself feels different under your feet. The sky takes on different hues. But he's also noticed that there's one thing that doesn't change. There's a great rock that protrudes out of the water just off the shore. And while everything else seems to change around it, that rock says the same. Now Steve was reflecting on how that rock has become a metaphor for him of God's enduring presence in his life. I think the psalmist would approve, wouldn't he? And so as we finish, let me get out of the rain here. I'm going to challenge you to think, what is your rock? What is your mountain of faith? What is it that you, the special place that you go to, where you get a chance to be attentive and aware of God's abiding presence in your life? I'm sure you have a place like that that you enjoy, enjoy going to. But if you don't, well, perhaps the challenge over this staycation is to open your eyes, to look around you, to be attentive in the theatre of God's glory. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.